right. Hi, everyone. Um, I hope there are people uh, attending, watching. Um, uh, please uh, welcome to Lahore Literary Festival online version of the festival this year. And um, I have with me today, uh, Shrabani Basu, who has written a really wonderful book. Um, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, I'm gonna get the title wrong. Mystery. Uh, Shrabani, why don't you go ahead? The Mystery, mystery of... of the Parsi Lawyer. <laughs> and here it is. I'm gonna hold up a copy because uh, I don't know if it's reached Pakistan yet. Ah, so. No, it yeah. hasn't yet. It hasn't, so it will get there. Good things, one has to wait for the good things. <laughs> And, and for, for people who don't know um, the story of the Parsi lawyer, um, uh, 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 Shapurji Edelji, who was a Parsi who converted to Christianity, um, uh, went from Bombay to England and was appointed the vicar of uh, a church in Great, Ry in Great Riley. Uh, which is one of those wonderful English town names that I like, Riley. I mean, I guess Worley. I mean, it's actually Worley. <laughs> Worley, Worley. Worley. Okay. Yeah. Well, which is which is metaphorically appropriate in a different ways, perhaps. Yes, um, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> um, and uh, his, uh, uh, who was the victim of a series of anonymous letters and. Um, uh, uh, that were threatening and aggressive, um, uh, threatening, really violently threatening, um, and was caught up in a series of uh, animal slaughters around the village where the vicar and, and where his son was accused of actually sending the anonymous letters and, and, um, and perpetrating those violent crimes uh, against horses, sheep, and cows, and, and other animals, um, which, which, in, in, in the context of agricultural England is a really heinous crime. This is people's livelihoods that were being taken away. Um, uh, he was put through, um, uh, I will let Shrabanu continue. Shrabani continue from there. Right, well, hi everybody. It's, it's lovely to be here. It's one of my favorite um, festivals, the Lahore Literature Festival. So great to be here again, uh, online of course. Um, so yes, uh, my latest offering is called The Mystery of the Parsi Lawyer. And um, this is, uh, so my, who is the Parsi lawyer? The Parsi lawyer is the son of Shapurji Edalji. Uh, he is, uh, his name is George Edalji. And he is 28 years old when this story starts. Uh, this is uh, the village of Great Worley. It's a few miles from Birmingham. It's in the Midlands. It's a mining village, very bleak. You can imagine what it's like. And of course, this Edalji family, they are the only Indians, the only dark family in this village, and he's the vicar. So here's the vicar, a brown man preaching the word of Christ to a completely white English audience. Uh, that's his, his parishioners are all white. Um, they, they are sort of working class, some are minors. There's also the aristocracy who own the land. So there's a lot of uh, tension in this air when this man comes with his family. His wife is English, Shapuji. His wife is English, and of course they have three children, George being the eldest. And um, in 1903 is when this terror grips this village. So this is the turn of the century. And suddenly animals are being slaughtered and they are being slaughtered and mutilated in a horrible way. It's a gruesome crime. So somebody comes at night, slashes the animals and leaves them to die in the field, a horrible death. And this happens repeatedly. It starts, it goes over six months and they can't find, a, a, you know, who did it. The police are there, they're totally inefficient. There's just a Bobby on the beat who's walking around. He can't do, find, do anything. And of course, rumors start circulating and anonymous letters start again. And, you know, when this village in, is in fear and rumors are circulating, who do you suspect? It's the only dark family in this village. And the eldest son, who's a bit of a loner. George is slightly odd looking, a bit of a loner. He's very bright. He doesn't have too many friends. And he goes on long walks. And the village think he did it. <laughs> and of course, this feeds into the prejudice that the police are convinced he's done it. And when a horse is killed very close to the vicarage, six months later, uh, the police arrest George Adalji they charge him with killing these uh, horses and he is actually he he is sentenced he's found guilty and he's sentenced to seven years in prison but that's only the first part of the story <laughs> 
right. Um, and could you talk a little bit about what got you excited about this story? Why you decided uh, mm -hmm. to write this this narrative? Um, uh, and I should mention that actually this narrative has been fictionalized by Julian Barnes in mm -hmm. a rather lovely novel called Arthur and George, which I remember reading 16, 17 years ago. Right, absolutely. Um, and in your introduction, you say that after reading, after no, hearing that uh, Barnes was actually publishing Arthur and George, that you put the project aside. I did, I did. Yeah, Barnes spoiled my party, as it were. I said, oh dear, he's done, he's done it before me. Uh, because I always knew about George Dalji. And, um, you know, the part two, as I said, that is part one when he's arrested, but that's just the beginning of the story because now we have the second character who comes in. And this is Arthur Conan Doyle, the most famous writer in Britain at the time, the most popular. And um, George in prison has been reading the Sherlock Holmes books. And he, when he writes to Arthur Conan Doyle and says, you know, you are the only one who can help me clear my name, prove that I'm innocent and, you know, wearing the hat of Sherlock Holmes, uh, you're the one who can do it. And Arthur Conan Doyle rises to this challenge. He, for some reason, he immediately feels that, you know, a miscarriage of justice has happened and he must champion this cause. So he takes it up with full vigor and he spends months over it. I mean, the book then goes into the, it's part two of the book is the investigation by Arthur Conan Doyle. And I actually follow, go on Arthur Conan Doyle's trail as he investigates. So it was great fun. And um, I, you know, as you said, Julian Barnes wrote about it in Arthur and George. And, you know, I said, oh, well, he's done it. What more can I do? But uh, I write nonfiction and I'm a journalist and I'm always looking for new material. And so though I parked George Adalji, you know, somewhere, I said, I think, um, you know, there's a chance that I'll go back to him sometime. And so new material came up in 2015. And that is what prompted me. And these were letters between Arthur Conan Doyle and the police force. And they dealt with the Adalji case. And so I was there on the trail following it. And the book follows the investigation. <laughs> And, and what did you uncover in the letters that was that gave you new material that you wanted to write about? Um, well, it was like just entering a minefield because I could see how interested Arthur Conan Doyle was in this. And at the same time, I could see how invested the police force were in seeing that this, you know, Arthur Conan Doyle does not solve this because that makes them look really bad. So the police chief, it then becomes a clash between the police chief and Arthur Conan Doyle. And that becomes really exciting because the police start laying false trails for Arthur Conan Doyle. This is all new material that, you know, nobody had seen. And it is, you know, it is a real, I won't give away too much, but it's really, it has all the plot twists that one can have. And uh, just the, the extent to which the police were ready to go, that the head of police, uh, a man called Anson. Um, well, it was quite interesting. <laughs> yes, well, you know, the one who was the one who retired from the force and then who directed the trial from behind the scenes in 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 some way. But yeah. but as you as you make very clear in in the narrative, this was a clear miscarriage of justice. And not only was it a clear miscarriage of justice, it was grounded in a very very British imperial sensibility relating to um, mm -hmm. Indians. Um, or, or as the British might have got termed them, uh, mm -hmm. termed George, even though they were Christians, heathens. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that, that it didn't matter that they had converted to Christianity, that they didn't matter that they had embraced Christ, that mm -hmm. what was more important was the color of their skin and the way that they stood out in great, in great whirly, um, mm -hmm. like short arms, right? Um, yeah, absolutely. And, it's uh, Anson actually refers to Shapurji Adalji, who is the vicar of Fred Worley, and he calls him the Hindu vicar. I mean, you know, it's, it was the generic name, Hindu, was what they used for all Indians. It didn't matter. And of course, he was not Hindu. I mean, he was not even Parsi, you know, he, he had embraced Christianity. So he had given up Zoroastrianism. He was a convert. Uh, but all that didn't matter. And when we talk about prejudice, from Ramji, if I may, I'll just read out what the press were writing, because, you know, I went into all the newspapers of the time because where else do you get an account of what is happening in this court yeah. you know how uh, you know what's the tension in this court well how are they seeing it so I'll, I'll just read a little bit about um, just two reports that um, 
during you know when he's sentenced these are the this is what comes out it's um it's quite revealing right so the daily mail which is uh, a tabloid as you can imagine uh writes those who closely studied this extraordinary criminal in the dock would have no doubt that he's a degenerate of the worst type his jaw and mouth are those of a man of very debased life Adalji has also gained for himself the reputation of being a lover of mystery, another oriental trait, and one that goes far to explain the anonymous letters. Love of mystery rather than bloodlust was, according to the Crown, the predisposing motive. So it's all about him being an oriental. Then uh, there's another report, the Birmingham Daily Gazette, and they write, the explanation of the choice is probably to be found in the circumstances that Adalji is of Eastern extraction. The subtle Eastern mind loves a mystery and is vain. The Eastern mind is satisfied with its secret. So, you know, all these things were coming up uh, as the press reported. And of course they go some way to uh, prejudice the jury because, you know, this is what they talk about. Um, there's another little bit where uh, the reporter from Wolverhampton Express and Star, <laughs> he's a local, local media, he goes and he's talking to the villagers and he writes, many and wonderful were the theories I heard propounded in the local alehouses as to why Adalji had gone forth in the night to slay cattle. And a widely accepted idea was that he made a nocturnal sacrifices to strange gods. So, you know, everything is revolving around this man, this dark man who goes out at night, makes nocturnal, because his religion demands it. It was ridiculous because, you know, Zoroastrianism has nothing to do with, you know, it's, exactly. it's, it's, it's you know, uh, ignorance. It's you know, what struck ignorance. me as most uh, really interesting about this case is it, it reminded me of another big spectacular case that involved, of course, Warren Hastings and the trial of Warren Hastings that ran, that ran for almost 15 years. Mm -hmm. um, in the yep. late, latter part of the 18th century. And yep. the language describing the Orient, the Oriental, the Indian, um, mm -hmm. that, that there hasn't been a remarkable shift in the language used to describe the Orient or Indians uh, for a hundred years. Um, yeah. I mean, this is a hundred years later, and, and it's still, this, the language is the same. They're, the English seem, the British seem to have learned nothing <laughs> about or at least the british in the homeland seem to have learned nothing and that their prejudices around uh dark-skinned individuals remained firmly in place even while they believed that they were on a civilizing mission to you know bring the heathens into the christian fold um and yeah and so what and, and then again recently uh, around brexit and the the language of xenophobia and the right so it's all it's, it's like this these these almost three spectacular events well um uh in their own time the trial of warren hastings which nobody remembers anymore um and this trial and then brexit which was in some ways an, a referendum and a trial um that the language in that the language in britain around race and the language in britain around um uh the the imperial mission or the colonial mm -hmm. mission if you will mm -hmm. has not changed at all and that seems to me some really quite shocking um, yeah. Exactly, because, you know, when at the last last year, you know, while we were in lockdown and I was, you know, finishing the last bit of the book, it was the final edits and the rewrites, is when the pandemic happened and Black Lives Matter happened. And suddenly there's this explosion and you're hearing these stories, but also, and you're just feeling what has changed? I am, <laughs> you know, writing about something that happened a hundred years ago, but what has changed? And it was this whole thing and then the culture wars started here you know how dare you want to pull down churchill because you know we are going to come and defend the statues and it led to something really nasty because i think it, i think britain went back many years all that had been gained was lost in you know these these debates this culture wars this thing these you know absolutely uninformed debates that started because you know, people who are questioning does not mean you're criticizing, you are questioning, which is absolutely, you know, everyone's right. But, you know, when you have people who don't know, who are in a mindset that you cannot question. Um, in fact, Brexit uh, was like some, there were some ministers who said it will be empire too. I mean, well, that sank like a lead balloon because, you know, gosh, that's the last thing that anybody wanted. But 
it was that whole, I think it started with 2016. This, there was a change, a shift in mood. And uh, this is where we are now. So hopefully it will improve from here. I think, you know, part of it is that, that post, uh, post World War II, that um, the events post World War II that have in a sense, um, uh, where Britain's empire has literally collapsed around it and under it, that, mm -hmm. that um, perhaps the British people are finally reckoning with an identity crisis that they need that, you know, that they have considered themselves uh, mm -hmm. um, up until very recently empire and empire builders. And that even though they're, even though the empire no longer exists, the Commonwealth exists. And the Commonwealth is some kind of residual echo of what, what existed before, but mm -hmm. that no longer exists. And I think the, that, that perhaps white British citizens are finally waking up to the fact that England or Britain is mm -hmm. a tiny island, a nondescript island, that has very little to say on the world stage or very little to contribute to the world stage given its history over the past four or 500 years. Um, mm -hmm. And I think partly Brexit is about that. I think Brexit mm -hmm. is partly about England trying, or at least a certain, a certain kind of British citizen reasserting privilege. Exactly. Certain, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, but I just hope it's a cycle because I mean, I'm, I'm an eternal optimist, so uh, I live here. I mean, there's so much about London and living here in Britain, which is absolutely wonderful. So, you know, there is no doubt about that. And equally, there are, um, there are people who, you know, if you look at the Black Lives Matter protests that happened, it isn't just black people walking there. It's a lot of young white people. So there are, there is a voice there uh, that supports these rights that are for these people. There is, you know, the footballers taking a knee during um, this. I mean, that's of course been criticized, but they are the, the fact is that, you know, they did it. And there's a lot of people who support it. Um, even when George was being, you know, attacked and, uh, you know, sent to prison, there were actually people then at that time supporting him and they were white people. I mean, forget Arthur Conan Joyce. Before him, there's 10,000 people who signed a petition saying there's been a miscarriage of justice. So yes, there's and, always yeah, been you people. Out, yeah. I mean, you point out the number of supported letters that Papuji received after yeah. George's conviction, right? And supported yeah. letters from townspeople and from people who knew George as yeah. school teachers or et cetera, um, yeah. who were incredibly supportive and, and were, were hugely doubtful of the verdict that had been laid down. Exactly. Um, there were lawyers, there were academics, there were so many people, as, you know, school students, uh, his former, former student, you know, student colleagues and uh, classmates, they all came forward. And similarly, right now, I mean, if you look at the footage of when Edward Colston, you know, the statue in Bristol of the black slave trader was pulled down, which, you know, went around the world, you'll see that it's not just black people pulling it down. There's a lot of young white people there, which people miss. And, you know, I think the point is that the culture wars, those who shout loudest are heard, and I yes. still feel they are a minority. They yes. are a small minority. They are heard because they shout the loudest. They have yes. the media, uh, which they can express themselves through. Uh, but by and large, and I think it's everywhere. It's not just England. You know, take India where you have hundred problems. <laughs> uh, take Pakistan. You know, take the U.S. Everywhere has problems with you know I'm dealing with minority. Right. I mean, yeah. in Pakistan, if you're not straight Sunni and Punjabi, you are essentially other. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, straight male Sunni and Punjabi, I should say. Mm -hmm. So, in a sense, um, you know, that kind of prejudice exists, I think, in every nation. Um, yeah. and, and, exactly. and, and the scapegoating and othering continues um, apace because it's how um, certain communities or certain majority groupings define mm -hmm. themselves, right? Yeah, define yeah. themselves as not them or not yeah. those. Exactly, exactly. Uh, and I mean, those who shout the loudest are often heard and you think they're the majority and they may not actually be. So one has, one has to keep the faith. <laughs> no, but I, mean, I can give you a really, and, and, and a, a recently, not recent, maybe about seven years ago, my uncle, my mamu's house, there was a burglary in my mamu's house. Um, mm -hmm. And when the police came to investigate, they interrogated, or of course, or everybody was in the house and all the servants, but the person they took the thana and beat up was the Bengali driver. <laughs> that because, and because he was the convenient scapegoat, right? So they right. didn't take any of the other servants to the thana, they just took the Bengali driver and they beat the shit out of them. Oh um, and we, yeah. we, because we, he was the he was the other right. person, and yeah. there was 
and and when he came back the next day you know and bruised and you know and, i mean my uncle at that uh, immediately decided that he was going to drop he was not going to pursue this and drop the charges because they, he simply didn't trust the police to actually investigate fairly or expediently uh -huh. or you know uh, uh -huh. deliberately enough uh, uh -huh. So and which is, seems to be the case. I mean, it's 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 that kind of response, right? Absolutely, it's just driven by prejudice, and then you know, then it's a cover up. After the prejudice, when Arthur Conan Doyle comes into the picture, then it's the cover up, and then it's like putting a false trail. So you know, lead him somewhere else, let him not succeed. So the Home Office. So Arthur Conan Doyle is up against the Home Office, the police force. But um, bless him, he just keeps going. He's like determined to, you know, uh, help Idalji. And well, thanks to him, he does get a free pardon. So that does happen. Uh, and well, I won't go into too much, but he does get it. So he's allowed to practice as a solicitor, which he wasn't before. So that was the desperate time when he wrote to Arthur Conan Doyle. He said, I have no income. You know, I, I can't practice as a solicitor. What am I to do? Clear my name. So uh, <laughs> saved, yeah. saved I mean, by there's, there's, there's a question from an audience member. So I wonder yeah. what would have happened yeah. to George Adelji had Doyle, had Conan Doyle not been involved. Um, and I imagine the answer to that was he would have languished in jail for seven years um, and uh, in, in imprisonment and hard labor. Um, uh, the kind of things that Oscar Wilde went through when he was imprisoned. I mean, I think that's the import of the verdict here. Um, mm -hmm. and may not have ever actually emerged from prison alive. Um, so, you know. Um, no, he, he, would, he was released on parole, but yes. what, was, what happened was that the, the charge still, he was still a convicted prisoner. And so he couldn't practice anymore. He had no income. So he would never have gone back to being a solicitor. And he would probably have had to do some menial jobs to get by, if at all, and just been, you know, had this, Hang on him, I mean, who knows what he would have done with his life. But uh, he was, a, the thing is, he, he was quite a fighter, though he was a very shy, awkward person with very few friends. I must, um, you know, must hand it to him that he was a determined chap, you know, in well, those days. It takes a little courage to think of writing to Arthur Conan Doyle, you know, pick up your yeah. pen, write to him and say, come and help me. <laughs> and then they would give friends. But you know, to consistently refuse bail, to say no, I will stay in prison, right? Um, whatever the conditions were um, at the time, so uh, uh, you know, to try and find ways or add strategies through which to prove his innocence. Yeah, um, yeah. Now, I, I, as I said to you earlier, I I got through three quarters of the book, but I have not completed it. So, without <laughs> without spoiling it for anybody, um, do we actually ever find out who uh, perpetrated these crimes? Well, I'm not going to say <laughs> <this>. <laughs> because uh, yeah, we've got to read on and find out what happened. Right. Uh, you know, it's mystery of the Whirly Ripper, as he was called. Yeah. So we've got to find out what happened. Did Arthur Conan Doyle actually solve it? Was he? Was he a good detective in real or could he just write Sherlock Holmes characters? I mean, what happened? So there's there's a lot of plot twists. So um, yes. we'll, we'll, we'll keep the readers guessing as to what and, happened. I mean, it really is, it's a detective story um, as and, and it's written as a detective story from and uh, giving us multiple points of view from different characters involved in the, in the incident and the events themselves. Um, but with many twists and many turns and um, uh, surprises, um, uh, quite a few um, interesting and, and some startling surprises. Um, so I think you've done a really nice job. So really, it's a wonderful book. Um, at you. least the part, you know, the three quarters I've read so far. Um, <laughs> and, I, and I have every intention of finishing it. And then I will go back and read Arthur and George, I think. Uh, <laughs> Which Thank is, you. Well, it goes, uh, I think Arthur and John, uh, George stops at a certain point. And so my book, because it's nonfiction and because of all the new material, I take it further into the investigation. And um, I mean, one of one of the really sweet, you know, moments of this relationship that they have, uh, Arthur Conan Doyle and this young Parsi lawyer, you know, who's, they, I mean, they come from such different worlds, was that they become such friends that when Arthur Conan Doyle gets married, uh, one of the guests is um, George Italci. Right. And he's standing there in a corner and, you know, you can imagine Arthur Conan Doyle's friends are all like the top, you know, everybody, the who's who of the literary world are there. And um, he's, there's George Italci amongst all these people, among the publishers, among the writers. And uh, later Arthur Conan Doyle writes that 
he was the guest. George was the guest he was proudest of. So I found that really sweet. So it shows that there was this really, um, you know, uh, trust, mutual respect. And of course, uh, you know, George was lucky that he took up his cause. Very lucky. Very lucky. Mm -hmm. And it's not something that, or that happened regularly, even though I'm certain that there were many other Indians who were convicted on false charges or uh, bungled investigations at the same time. Absolutely. One of the really nice things about the book, which I wanted to point out to, uh, to the audience, is that you very nicely contextualize what is going on in England in relation to um, its British Empire and also Parsis who happened to be in England at the time pursuing different um, uh, different vocations, perhaps. So, uh, Dada, Bina, Dada Boy Naroji, who had, uh, uh, who was about to win his uh, seat in the first Indian in the, in the English Parliament. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Cornelia Sorabji, who was the first, uh, the first female oh, lawyer. Mm -hmm. um, to graduate from uh, Cambridge, Oxford, Cambridge, Oxford, Oxford. Oxford. Um, Oxford. and then to go, back, to go back to Mumbai, Bombay and practice. Um, yeah. so, that, so that Parsis themselves were not unknown to the English at this point. Um, no, I mean, he was an MP, the first Indian MP uh, was Dadabai Naroji. And uh, so what also puzzled me was why didn't Shapuji write to these you know, MPs and ask for their help. You know, there's the Parsi, uh, there were three Parsi MPs uh, and one of them was in office when all this was happening. But I think he had left his roots behind, you know, Shapuji, and he'd left the community behind. And he was fighting a battle as an Englishman in, in that sense, you know, fighting for justice, which is the, you know, the sort of the, <laughs> the foundation of what they call their English society. So he was fighting for that and he was fighting for it as on his own with support of others. But uh, he never took the Parsi angle and went for, um, you know, Parsi support. <laughs> um, and he could very well have done that. But but I think you're right. I think that and, and that not only that, that he saw himself as English, um, mm -hmm. having been in England for you know, 40 plus years, having been the vicar of, um, you know, serving as the vicar of the, the church in Great Worley. Uh, mm -hmm. All of these things I think were, were played into his, I think his ignorance and blindness about what was actually happening. That I think he was, I, I think the way, the way you represented that he was blindsided by mm -hmm. the prejudice that that was, that existed in the trial, especially in the trial, but also of course the letters and the killing. Of but course. Do, you, yeah, yeah. Um, do you think you could read a little bit, uh, Shravani, so that we could get a sense of um, the writing and the story that you're telling? Yeah. Um, shall I write about, uh, read the first bit, um, his first night in the jail? Would you like me to sure. do that? that or oh, do you want some gruesome bits? The, <laughs> the, killing, bit is it the killing Fields <laughs> uh, chapter seven, which I thought was kind of fun. Okay, um, so let's go to the gruesome bit. <laughs> we'll go to the gruesome bit. Um, on 1st February 1903, the first of the animal killings took place in Great Worley. A horse was killed in Cheslin Hay, an area north of the vicarage. It was a two-year-old colt that belonged to a local shopkeeper. The colt's stomach had been slashed and it had been left to die in the field. The incident would have passed off uh, as a one-off or as a case of a grudge against the owner, which sometimes happened in agricultural communities. But in a chilling repeat of the first mutilation, Another horse was killed on 10th of April. Terror gripped the village of Great Worley as the killings continued in quick succession. Villagers watched in horror as the bodies of the mutilated horses were put on carts and removed from the fields. Photographers milled around the spot, capturing the sights for local newspapers. There was something sinister about the mutilations and the torture. Who would do this to the animals, asked the helpless villagers. In the month of May, a cow was attacked in Lower Landywood. This was followed by the killing of a sheep and a horse. It was as if a curtain of darkness was descending on the village, blackening the very heart and soul of the community. Farmers looked suspiciously at their laborers and miners searched for reasons for the madness. The small agricultural community had never seen anything like it. Suspicion bred suspicion and the very air seemed to be poisoned. Relentlessly, the killer went on. On 6 June, two cows belonging to Captain Harrison were killed. The Staffordshire police were now on high alert. On 8th June, they brought in about 20 officers from different areas of the country to patrol the streets and fields. 
The police seemed to be hopeless at catching the culprits. The terrified villagers started comparing the killer to Jack the Ripper, who had disemboweled prostitutes in East London only a few years previously and had never been caught. Every killing followed a regular pattern. The killer would attack the animal with a sharp instrument and leave it to die. He appeared and disappeared in the dead of night and no one seemed to have any idea who was responsible. Yes, um, uh, perhaps we could ask um, audience members if they have questions, um, uh, things that they would like to ask about the case, about the writing, about uh, Shrabani's interest um, or the wider interests, things she's working on now. What are you working on right now? Oh, <laughs> nothing at the moment. I've just finished this. It's been it's been a hard. Uh, it took me five years to write this book, so it's been it's been a long haul and. Uh, well, then the pandemic happened, and I think we are all very, very exhausted. So yeah. uh, uh, I think take a little break is what I'll do, and then you know take things from there. Um, yeah. But there are always stories, uh, you know, they will come my way, and I will get into them. But uh, yeah, at the moment, taking it easy, <laughs> you know, just, just seeing this year through and hoping things get back to normal. I mean, it's so hard to even get into libraries right now because you know it's limited spaces and stuff. So yeah, yeah right. taking a little break. <laughs> Yes, and, and from what I understand, um, the, the Delta variant is now making the rounds in England. So uh, yes. that's something to be really concerned about. Um, so, yeah. But anyway, that's, that's where we are at the moment. <laughs> but uh, hopefully we will, we will see this through. Yes. Everyone sees everything through. <laughs> like. um, uh, anything else that you that you want to talk about in relation to the research you did? Um, uh, I mean, I I mean, this is an incredibly well researched book. I mean, uh, it's clear that you have been through archives and letters and interviews and um, you know uh, to to the British Library and did, you know to various other resources. Um, Though, did you find material in India? I mean, certainly the early part of the book about Shapur, Shapurji and his conversion, I'm assuming those, um, th those archives or those reports are in India, those documents are in India. Uh, no, actually, um, just, the, just the church, just the church is there in India. So when I went to Bombay, I sort of drove past to see the church uh, where he was baptized. Uh, but to know um, all the research, all the material is here in different archives. So I had to go to Portsmouth archives and Staffordshire and Birmingham and of course uh, in London where we have the national archives in Kew so um, and then the newspaper archives because you know as I mentioned I love reading the news old newspapers I mean they are just they're just fabulous to read and as a journalist myself I love love to see the language and yeah. their attitude um, so yeah it was it was a really hard work four years uh, five years and then the writing and everything so yeah yes. uh, and you but know, I for, enjoy for, research. It's what I do. So, um, but I, I think for for people who don't understand um, the how newspapers functioned in the nineteenth century, early part of the twentieth century, that this the the notion of objective reporting was not part of journalistic language at that point yet, um, and and many newspapers were affiliated with different political parties and with different uh, communitarian organizations, and therefore um, embraced the biases of those parties and organizations in their reporting and their writing. So when you read the newspaper uh, accounts in Shravani's uh, in Shravani's book, um, you have to remember that it was a very different time with a very different set of expectations and a very different rule book in terms of reporting. Um, certainly, reporting a, a sensational case like this, where and sensationalism would be the would be the order of the day. Yes, absolutely. And uh, they also loved gossip, of course. Which I mean, newspapers still do. So you know, who who doesn't want to read the gossip columns in newspapers, the diary items? So they were all there. And so everything to me is a source of information. And uh, that's how I've always worked. Uh, even with Victoria and Abdul, my previous book. Um, yeah. I love to read the, what the gossip <laughs> columnists were saying about Abdul. <laughs> and, you know, that gives you material. <laughs> so, so I have a question. So, and you titled the book, The Mystery of the Parsi Lawyer, but he is not really a Parsi at this point. I mean, he has, I mean, while ethnically a Parsi, which would, I mean, given that Parsi is more an ethnic designation than a religious designation, um, that he would remain ethnically a Parsi, though perhaps, will, um, but but a Christian at the same time. Um, but in a sense, Parsi doesn't really figure into the the home life 
of okay. Shapuji and um, and his wife and the children. That that you know, Parsi rituals, Parsi customs, Parsi ways of doing things are not really part of their world. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, why did you choose to to what, because he was referred to as the Hindu and the Parsi yes. or be, yes. because precisely that because this whole case is looked at he is the Parsi you know that is the important thing for everybody around while the family themselves you know in the vicarage are leaving a leading a very English life it's everyone else is seeing them purely as Parsis you know they are the foreigners in this village he is the Parsi and um, the press reports are about the Oriental the and even Arthur Conan Doyle, he compares it to the Dreyfus case in France, yes. where a Jew is, uh, you know, is sentenced uh, for leaking uh, military secrets and uh, Alfred Dreyfus. And he is, and it's a very famous case. Yes, uh, yes. So he says that, um, you know, the Emile Zola wrote an article, Jacques, yeah. which is where this all comes from. Uh, so um, he compares it to the Dreyfus affair. And he says that happened with a Jew this is happening with a Parsi. So the Parsi element is very important because that is what is defining this whole case. And so I, I decided to, you know, <laughs> put it in the title. I didn't and even want Indian in the title. I wanted Parsi because to me, that was important. <laughs> For me, you know, one of the interesting things about Parsi is the difference between Parsis in the 20th century and Parsis in the 19th and 18th century is that, um, in many ways, Parsis of the 19th century, let me put it that way, were um, those uh, Macaulay's Western Oriental gentlemen, right? They were the, the Indians in, in uh, blood and color, but English in tastes, manner and customs and, and knowledge. That they were the class of people that the British in their imperial world singled out for education so that they would be their middlemen, right? The Parsis ended up being middlemen between the, their, the British overlords and the Hindu and Muslim Sub, Hindu, Muslim, and Christian subjects of the exactly. subcontinent. Um, mm -hmm. The Parsis were not necessarily held in as perhaps high regard in the 19th century. I mean, they were traders and merchants, but they made most of their money, including, and I shouldn't say this publicly, but, uh, but you know, the families like the Tata Savadias, they made their money smuggling mm -hmm. opium uh, okay. in the yeah. opium trade. Absolutely, um, the opium trade. I mean, I say it in the book that they, they've got rich in the opium trade. They were working with the East India Company. So, you know, that is the background. Uh, but they are westernized. And yes. so they are seen as rich pickings for conversion. Yes. So they were targeted. And that is why quite a few Parsis converted to Christianity. So the backstory of Shapurji and what was going on in India was also very important to me. Like, why did this man convert? Why did he come here to be? the vicar of this godforsaken place. So, you know, all that was important. And that I think and, is- and, 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 you know, and, and I think that, the, that the, 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 the history of the Parsis in the 19th century <laughs> And, um, and the ways in which they were complicit in the imperial project, the ways in which they, uh, you know, I'm saying this about my own community and my own people. Um, I mean, uh, when I was younger, I still remember um, uh, an older generation. So say my grandparents' generation who were born in the early part of the 20th century, who would say things in Gujarati like Apri Rani ne Apri Raja, right? My king and my queen, as if somehow uh, a partition has happened, independence has happened, you know, we're 20, 30 years beyond it, but they're still talking about their own, their king and their queen. Um, so Parsis, are, uh, Parsis are, are, are that strange community in limbo, in a sense, in, uh, but in the, in the imperial order, they knew their place. And, their, and I think part of maybe what, what Shapurji experiences is a complete dislocation of, of his sense of self, because he sees himself as English. And mm -hmm. Christian at that, and married to an English wife, white yeah. English wife at that, um, mm -hmm. and suddenly the entire uh, the entire weight of the criminal justice system in England is falling on his son's head for mm -hmm. no reason other than the fact that he once lived in India, <laughs> right? Sure. Which he had, which mm -hmm. he has turned his back on and left. Mm -hmm. right? So, yeah. and I think yeah. that's. Yeah, the irony of the whole thing is that he left it and he thought he'd get, you know, justice, civilization, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And of course, it, it doesn't come to him. But there we are. That was, uh, you know, his calling. But um, 
<laughs> which is how many of uh, many Indians and Pakistanis think when they when they leave here to emigrate to England and to the U.S. and Canada and Australia, thinking that somehow they will be leaving behind mm -hmm. um, the biases and prejudices of, of of Pakistan or India or Bangladesh, and they arrive in England and in fact that's they run right into them yeah. right away, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and I yeah. think that's. That is very much part of what you're writing about, yes? Yeah, absolutely. It is, you know, when Shapuji goes there and there's graffiti outside the vicarage and all he does is he just swipes it off and goes. It reminded me of the 60s and 70s when, you know, you had all the corner shops, they were owned by Indians and Pakistanis and they would come and do the graffiti, you know, break the, break the glass. And the person would come the next day, just clean it up and start all over again. You know, there was no protest there and they would just do it. They kept their head down, the early immigrants and, you know, 60s, 70s, um, they just got on with it. The, the Bangladeshi serving in the curry houses, you know, eaten up, just went on. And this is what, um, in a sense, in a way, in a much less harsh way. I mean, he was, they were never beaten up or anything. So, but, you know, he was in prison, his son went to jail. So that is awful. <laughs> With with the, you know serious felons, so right. and, you know, and their name is tarnished, or and their reputation is exactly. tarnished, or exactly. right, which exactly. is almost impossible to regain in the context uh -huh. of in the early part of the century. Uh -huh. So, um, <laughs> any very questions? famous writer came to his defense. So yeah, well, he did well <laughs> anyway. Yes, but Conan, but Conan Doyle is the other person in this narrative, right? And we haven't really discussed him at all, um, mm -hmm. but. But you do a really nice job of setting up uh, Conan Doyle and and um, uh, you know his mentoring uh, uh, the mentoring by uh, Professor Bell, um, his teacher, um, his um, how he how Conan Doyle fashioned himself as Watson with uh, with uh, Holmes uh, with Holmes in a sense the model for Holmes was his mentor or teacher the one who taught him how to observe and how to look and how to um, how to um, put connect the dots in a sense to, to take all of the details that one observes and then put them together into a sort of narrative into a into a into a narrative that makes sense a coherent narrative let's say of course, yeah. uh, which is partly what you are doing as well right so this is what writers do especially nonfiction writers you have all of this material and then mm -hmm. you have to connect the dots and put it all together and coherent. get a narrative yeah, well, it was all about deduction so the first meeting he, uh, he has with you know Holmes's right. method to all, all those who, uh, you know, love, love his books, uh, Sherlock Holmes is all about deduction. He'll, he'll deduce 10 things right at the start before he's even said a word. And Arthur Conan Doyle does exactly that. So his first meeting with George Adalji is classic. He's a little late, he invites him to the hotel. He, he's a little late, so he stops by the door and he observes. And George is reading a newspaper. He's the only Indian in the room, so he's instantly recognizable. <laughs> he's holding a newspaper close to his face. And he says, um, he realizes that he's severely myopic. And immediately he deduces that George couldn't have done it. George is innocent because he could not have, with such severe myopia, he could not have crossed dark fields in the night, uh, slashed cattle, and then could return back, you know, over these fields. So he says, he knows instantly. So it's it's just like the way Sherlock Holmes works is what Conan Doyle is doing. He's, he's doing what his detective does. And he, within the first few minutes, he knows George is innocent. So it's a good, it's a good setup and a good start to the. Narrative. And you set that up very nicely. I mean, you say so that you have the alternating narrative when, um, before before the convergence, in a sense, before Conan Doyle meets George, that mm -hmm. there uh, there is a life here and there is a life here, and they are proceeding down these two tracks and. Mm -hmm. uh, in in that hearty sense, you know, the convergence of the twain where the ice and the ship come together. Um, but it's very nicely done, I wanted to say. And 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 um and it's not overdone. So it's not it's there you haven't given us reams of information about Conan Doyle's life or his psychology or his history that would be unnecessary in the context of this narrative, which I think is very nicely done. But you have given us that in the context of the Adelji family and all of the uh, uh, participating um, uh, secondary characters and actors in that story. Um, 
so it, it, there's a really nice balance that you've achieved and and so and that's hard to achieve so well congratulations and well done on that. thank you thank you it's probably why it took me five years to write well, <laughs> getting okay. that balance yeah. but i hope i hope the readers enjoy it i mean i don't know you i guess you can get it on kindle until the real books arrive but you know there um, we are. Is it available on kindle through amazon or through it is on kindle yeah okay. yeah yeah. Absolutely. I, I imagine they will be here relatively soon, though chances are they'll be available in Lahore before they're available in Karachi, um, because um, readings and uh, readings and um, uh, the last word tend to order things well in advance, whereas Liberty Books tends not to order things well in advance. Oh, um, okay. <laughs> so so it, it should be available, I, I would imagine, in the next few weeks. Um, uh, excellent. Well, I hope everybody enjoys it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, um, I think we're almost at at time, uh, uh, would you like to add anything? Anybody have any questions who is uh, attending, watching? Yeah, I guess we could probably end it here at this moment. Yeah. Uh, we probably reached the end of our hour. So, yep. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank, <laughs> thank you, for you. Thank you for the book. Um, mm -hmm. And thank you for the conversation. Um, good luck on your next project. Um, <laughs> stay healthy, stay virus free. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, stay safe, as one says in these meetings. <laughs> that's uh, that's what we have to do. And I hope you recover fully. So take care. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Bye bye, uh, everyone. Thank lovely. you for. Bye bye. Lovely to be here.